What makes a proof beautiful? Maybe simplicity, or elegance, or a nice visual? To me, a proof is beautiful when it forms surprising connections between unrelated aspects of math. Take analytic number theory, for example. There's a famous book in math called Proofs from the Book. The book is a term coined by Paul Erdős that refers to a book in which God kept the most elegant proofs of every single mathematical theorem. Proofs from the book aims to be an approximation, a list of proofs that the authors believe would be contained in the book. Let's turn to chapter 4, which is all about representing numbers as sums of two squares. The theorem today is on page 21, dubbed Fermat's Two Squares Theorem. It states that every prime of the form 4k plus 1 can be expressed as a sum of two squares. So for instance, 13 is 4 times 3 plus 1, and can be written as 3 squared plus 2 squared. 29 is 4 times 7 plus 1, and can be written as 5 squared plus 2 squared, and so on. You get the idea. If we go down a bit, the book refers to a one-sentence proof of this theorem. And this proof is, well, mind-boggling. I mean, look at it. I certainly had no idea where to begin when I first read it. But if we unpack each word and what it's saying, it comes together beautifully in the end. I feel like it hits every single aspect of beauty I mentioned at the beginning. There are a ton of little parts to this proof, so feel free to rewind as I go through it. Let's begin. Before we delve into the proof, let's cover some background required. The first two words of the proof are the involution. So what even is an involution? Consider a set S. In this case, my set consists of three colored balls and some function that maps elements of S to another element of S. So here, red maps to itself, green maps to blue, and blue maps to green. An involution is a function that is its own inverse. In other words, f of f of x equals x for all x and s. Try and verify that the function I've presented here is even an involution. The initial ordering is red, green, blue. So let's apply the function. Notice how red maps to itself, and green and blue simply swap positions. So if I apply the function twice, it just puts them back in their original place. Since applying the function twice puts them back in their own place, the function is its own inverse and hence an involution. Some common involutions over the real numbers include f of x equals negative x, and f of x equals 1 over x. Here, with f of x equals negative x, notice how applying the function twice preserves the order of the colors. In other words, negative of negative x is just x. Okay, let's head back to the set of colored balls S, and try and construct an involution. We need to define a function f that takes in elements of S and outputs elements of S, such that applying it twice maps everything back to itself. Now one way to make an element, say this blue one here, map to itself after two applications of the function, is to just map it to itself. We call these fixed elements. But what about the elements that don't map to itself? Here, consider the green element. After two applications of f, green must map to green. So there must be some intermediary element that green maps to. And this intermediary element must map to green. The only way this is possible is if those two elements map to each other. And so the elements that don't map to each other come in pairs. We call them paired elements. This is great, we've essentially boiled down that for a given involution on a set, each element must either map to itself, or be paired with a different element. Maybe this isn't too surprising, but the reason we make this distinction is that it allows us to say things about the entire set S, given information only about the paired elements or the fixed elements. Let me show you an example. We know that paired elements come in twos, so the number of paired elements has to be even. Previously, we described how every element in an involution is either a fixed element or a paired element, so the total size of the set equals the number of fixed elements plus the number of paired elements. 
Given that the number of paired elements is even, this tells us that the parity of the size of the set is completely determined by the parity of the number of fixed elements. In other words, if the number of fixed elements is odd, then the size of S is odd. If it's even, the size of S is even. Maybe a quick exercise is to convince yourself that adding an even or odd number with an even number preserves its parity. This statement will be the final puzzle piece to our proof, so it's important to keep it in mind. As I go through the heart of this proof, it might seem a little disconnected, but I promise it's worth seeing through to the end. My favorite thing about number theory is how simple the theorems are to state, but how wildly complicated the proofs are, especially when they touch on unexpected areas of math. I mentioned analytic number theory in the beginning as an example, so consider something like the Riemann zeta function. This proof is no exception, with some beautiful visuals to showcase. Remember that what we're trying to prove is that any prime p of the form 4k plus 1 can be expressed as a sum of two squares. What this proof does is instead of breaking p down into two squares, it breaks it down into one square and four rectangles, this sort of windmill figure. Let's call the side length of the square x, and the side of each rectangle touching the square y, and the other z. This was a bit vague, so let's boil down exactly what I'm saying. Consider a number n. The set of windmills of n, wn, is defined as the set of all triples, x, y, and z, where x, y, and z are all natural numbers, such that n equals x squared plus 4 of y, z. For instance, for the number 29, 3, 1, 5 forms a windmill since 29 is 3 squared plus 4 times 1 times 5. Here are all the windmills of 29. Feel free to pause and see if you can notice any patterns. If I set n to be some prime p of the form 4k plus 1, you can see that if y is equal to z, this forms a solution to p is equal to a squared plus b squared, since now p is equal to x squared plus 4y squared, which equals x squared plus 2y whole squared. So now our new goal is transformed from expressing p as a squared plus b squared to does there exist a windmill for p with y is equal to z. It may seem like I've transformed the original statement into a harder one, I mean like why windmills? Well what it allows for is a larger set to play around with, of which you can use certain properties to find the element where y is equal to z. Let's consider the set of all windmills for a given prime number p of the form 4k plus 1, say 13. 13 has three windmills, 1, 1, 3, 1, 3, 1, and 3, 1, 1. As a sanity check, notice that there does exist a windmill with y is equal to z, namely 3, 1, 1. And this tells us that 13 is 3 squared plus 4 squared. Okay, one thing I want you to see is that for a given prime p of the form 4k plus 1, there exists at least one windmill. Maybe some of you can see what that is, it happens to be 1, 1, k. So with 13, this windmill is 1, 1, 3. You can see that it forms a windmill by plugging it in. So 1 squared plus 4k equals 4k plus 1, which equals p. But what I want to show you is that for a prime number of the form 4k plus 1, 1, 1, k is the only windmill with x is equal to y. In other words, it's the only windmill with the side of the square equal to the side of each rectangle touching the square. Let's see why this would be true. Consider trying to construct a windmill with x is equal to y, whose area is some prime p is equal to 4k plus 1. Since x is equal to y, we have two parameters to adjust, the side length of the square and the height of the four rectangles. 
the total area is x squared plus 4xz, which factored as x times x plus 4z. Let's say x is not equal to 1. Then x plus 4z cannot be equal to p or 1. This means that we found a decomposition of p where both elements are not 1 or p, which contradicts what a prime number is. That means that x has to be equal to 1, and so z has to be equal to k. Once again, this is one of those facts that will only show its usefulness to the end, so when it comes up, I'll refer you back to this timestamp, but try and keep it in mind for now. So far, I've introduced two distant concepts. First, the idea of an involution, which is a function that's its own inverse. Then, the idea of a windmill for a number n, which was defined by a triple x, y, z, such that x squared plus 4yz is equal to n. Now, let's look at these two in action. For a number n and its corresponding set of windmills wn, what's the simplest involution we can think of? Let's go back. Remember the involution we constructed with three balls? We had one fixed element and two paired elements. Well, let's say the first one is x, the second one is y, and the third one is z, and apply this to windmills. This gives us a map from a windmill xyz to a windmill xzy. As we saw before, two applications of this mapping results in xyz, which is what we started with. Let's call this the flip map. So for example, 315 becomes 351, and vice versa. Let's remember when we first talked about windmills. I said that if I could find a windmill of a prime p is equal to 4k plus 1, such that y is equal to z, then we'd have solved the original problem, since p is equal to x squared plus 4y squared is equal to x squared plus 2y whole squared, which gives us a decomposition of p into two squares. Now consider a windmill that the flip map maps to itself, a fixed point. What can you say about this windmill? Well, since y and z switch places, y must be equal to z. Okay, now we've transformed the problem again. Instead of trying to prove that a prime p of the form 4k plus 1 can be broken down into two squares, we're trying to prove that a fixed point does exist when applying the flip map to the windmills of primes of the form 4k plus 1. But how do we prove that the flip map has a fixed point? Okay, let's turn heads and look at a different involution, the Zagier map. This is one of those things that has a really simple and nice visual interpretation that's not at all obvious from looking at the equations. As such, I want to start by showing you what the map is visually. Let's start with a windmill of 29, 351. The first step in the Zagier map is to find the largest possible central square, which happens to be this here. If the central square is smaller than the largest square, we transform it into the largest square. So now we get the windmill 511. Notice how the area didn't change, we only changed the central square, so it still is a windmill of 29. But what if the central square happens to be the largest possible square? Now our goal becomes the opposite, to make the central square as small as possible by extending the arms of the rectangles. You can see how this arm extending process is essentially the reverse of the square extending process, so the operation is its own inverse, and hence an involution. Writing out the involution is just a matter of casework, and the Zagier map is in fact the large map you saw in that one sentence proof. I've written it all out here, so feel free to pause and convince yourself that they work. So for example in case 4 when y is less than x and x is less than 2y, we need to extend the arms, so we shorten x to 2y minus x and extend z to x plus z minus y. The most important case though, is when x is equal to y. If x is equal to y, there are no arms to extend. 
so this windmill becomes a fixed point of the Zagir map. We are finally ready to complete the proof. Let's start with the fixed points of the Zagir map, which occur when x is equal to y. When I introduced windmills, I said that 1 1 k is always a windmill for primes of the form 4k plus 1. I also said that 1 1 k is the only windmill of these primes with x is equal to y. This tells us that the Zagier map over primes of the form 4k plus 1 has one and only one fixed point. Let's go back to when we talked about involutions. I said that if the number of fixed points is odd, the size of the set is odd. Well, we know the Zagier map has only one fixed point, so the size of the set of windmills for a prime of the form 4k plus 1 has to be odd. Now we turn heads to the flip map. Since the size of the set is odd, the number of fixed points of the flip map must be odd. The lowest possible number is 1, so there has to be a fixed point. In other words, there has to be a point where y is equal to z, resulting in p is equal to x squared plus 4y squared is equal to x squared plus 2y squared, completing our proof. Let's finish it off by going back to the one sentence proof to see that it makes sense. We start out by defining S, the set of windmills, then we define the Zagier map, stating that it has one fixed point. This implies that the size of the set is odd, and that the flip map also has a fixed point, implying that we can break down the prime p is equal to 4k plus 1 into a sum of two squares. G. H. Hardy once wrote that unfortunately there is no proof of Fermat's two squares theorem within the comprehension of anybody but a fairly expert mathematician. If you manage to follow this, give yourself a pat on the back. You are a fairly expert mathematician. This proof was by no means easy to understand. There are so many moving parts and don't feel ashamed to give it another pass through. I personally had to do a couple before grasping it. Despite its difficulty, can't we all agree that this proof was beautiful? Who would have expected windmills out of all the things? Thanks for watching.